my name is Wei Xi. Um, I'm currently an OS technical expert at Huawei, and I also contribute to the open OLED community. My talk today would be GMAM, which is in short for generalized memory management, and we are doing this for accelerators. So as you guys know, this is currently a golden age of accelerators, and you can see a lot of um, AI applications, including the GPT-4 robotics um, databases or maybe other DNA sequences, some kind of tasks. And these applications are actually supported by these domain-specific accelerators, including the GPUs, the TPUs, or other DSAs. So before I'm introducing GMAM, here's a little bit history about GMAM and what we're going to do in the future. The original idea of GMAM was um, originated from my PhD study at Rice University, um, where I worked with both my advisors, uh, Scott Rixner, um, who is an expert at the microarchitecture field, and my other advisor, Alan Cox, who is a um, kernel maintainer for the FreeBSD community. So I was able to, um, I was able to uh, look at the the idea from two aspects, both from the microarchitecture and from the OS design principles. And we decided that D GMAM would be the heart of OpenOS OS for AI. And there would be a Linux-based version soon to be available in the early October. So memory is indeed the core of AI infrastructure. As you can see, the AI and heterogeneous applications would require CPU coordination because the domain specific accelerators cannot do all kinds of jobs. We still need to use the general purpose CPUs to do other tasks. At the same time, they require a huge amount of memory to process a large volume of data, and they need quite fast memory allocation speed and high memory utilization because HBM is so scarce. Um, as you can see from the Hopper CPU, the Hopper GPU, sorry, which is the most advanced accelerator, I guess, at, the, at this moment, it only has like 100 gigabytes of HVM. However, the reality is actually bad because the, the accelerators, we have poor programmability. If you guys have written any, um, if you guys have written any CUDA applications, you, you know that you need to allocate your CPU buffer and at the same time allocating your GPU buffer and transfer this data between the two buffers. At the same time, we have this out of memory problem because accelerators have small HBM capacity. And also, these AI frameworks, they develop their own malloc and free library, but this re-implementation does not really function well. And we see a lot of memory fragmentation issue in these AI frameworks. For example, we, we see this um, failure of malloking 500 megabytes memory, given that the accelerator still has 10 gigabytes of free HBM. So if we dig a little bit deeper, we can see that here is a cost of reinventing the malloc library. And by malloc library, here I mean that Typically, we can use like TC malloc from Google um, or JE malloc from Facebook, PT malloc from glibc. We can use all of these malloc libraries for the CPU applications. But when it goes to the AI framework, the underlying memory um, service cannot be provided by the operating system. So like PyTorch, TensorFlow, they have to implement their own library. And if you take a look at them, they spend around like 4,000 to 6,000 lines of code. And do they really work well in reality? So we make a comparison between PyTorch and JE malloc using the same workload from a large language model. And we see that the malloc latency from PyTorch is around 1,000 nan nanoseconds, while it is 300 nanoseconds. So it's like three times slower from PyTorch re-implementation. So things could be even worse when we look at the underlying memory management subsystem. So we first take a look at what does the kernel do? 
the Linux Core MM has 80,000 lines of code, while the FreeBSD has 30,000 lines of code. And well, this is kind of common because FreeBSD is more of a um, academic view of, of the operating system, so the the code, the number, the lines of code is like fewer. But when it goes to device driver, for example, NVIDIA's CUDA driver, it spans like 100,000 lines of code, and 30,000 lines of code from its GPU MM, and 70,000 lines of code from the UVM driver, supporting the kernel level swapping. And we also take a look at the AMD driver and Huawei's ASIN driver. They, they share like similar magnitude of memory management code. And we, we would have this doubt that whether these memory subsystems have bugs, system overhead, or memory fragmentation issue. Because the memory management system is like very complicated, and it has been evolved over a long time in the operating system, but accelerators are quite new. So this really ultimately gives us the motivation of GMAM. And the first motivation is that we want to stop people from further reinventing the wheel. And this includes two aspects. One is not to implement any more malloc library for your GPU or TPU or whatever. The second is not to re-implement any memory management systems for your device drivers. And secondly, we want to enhance the programmability of the accelerators as we are going to provide a unified virtual address space so that your pointers can be shared between your CPU and accelerators. And at the same time, we will allow your application to oversubscribe your device memory so that you don't need to write any lines of code just to, like, you can, you can even use one terabyte of memory even though your HBM is like 30 gigabytes. And ultimately, we are going to provide better memory service this includes both faster malloc speed and higher memory utilization. So before we are looking at any kind of design, we want to ask the question like, why can the operating system manage any accelerator's memory? And to answer this question, ultimately the memory subsystem, subsystems are all, all the same. Because if we, if we divide the design and the implementation of all the existing memory management subsystems, we can see that there are four components. The first two components are virtual address allocation and deallocation, while the second, and as well as the physical address allocation and deallocation. So you guys might be familiar that the first part is basically about your M map or MR map, and the second part is mostly about your body allocator or transparent huge page, which is more complicated, but ultimately they are the same. While the last two components, the virtual to physical address mapping management and the physical data preparation, they involve hardware specific handling. So if you are using a CPU with a different microarchitecture, for example the x86 or ARM or whatever else, or you're switching to a GPU card, for example in NVIDIA you may use Pascal or Hopper or Ambier or whatever, the underlying, only the two components would be affected so with this understanding of the memory management subsystems, we now have a high level view of GMAM design. So if you take a look at the left part of the figure, this is basically how the current situation works. We have this parallel address space exposed to the upper level application so that making the programmers difficult to write their program. The GPU address is not the same as the as a CPU address, so you cannot use them on different accelerators or different processors. And underneath the CPU address, you have the Linux Core MM, which is basically 80,000 lines of code, as well as the GPU address space, underlying of which has over 70,000 lines of code from your GPU driver. And these two memory subsystems, they are independent, so they don't really coordinate. If we look at the right side of the figure, which is currently the GMAM's design, we have a unified address space on top, of the, on top of the system so that the application can use it. And underneath the unified address space, we have a Linux Core MM and a GMAM layer that coordinates 
deeply inside, inside the Linux MM. So for any accelerator, and here we use the GPU as an example, it only takes like 100 lines of code simply to call the GMAM API interface, as well as registering the underlying dev architecture specific functions. So here we have the four different design principles. The, one de the first design principle is that we only provide high level APIs just as the GMAM API, so that device drivers don't need to reinvent all these hardware independent mechanisms. The second principle is that we want to decouple the low level MMU handling. And just as registering the device specific architecture functions, because current Linux design, you can only register different CPU architecture functions, but it is not really scalable or extendable to the accelerators. And the third and the fourth is basically registering their own MMU functions so that we don't limit your microarchitecture design and we coordinate multiple page tables within each address space. And we, we would have this question about comparing against the, the current situation, like here's already a solution named Linux HMM, which is in short for heterogeneous memory management. And the question is why not you just use it? So in one sentence, the problem is that HMM does help collaborations between device drivers and Linux MM. But HMM cannot prevent reinventing your memory mechanisms. So we take a look at this diagram, and the left part of the diagram is basically your application's malloc, your system call, and your Linux MM. And we see that HMM only provides two mechanisms. One mechanism is the MMU notifier, which is triggered at the time of some certain Linux MM events. So if your device driver is using HMM, you may register some functions to be triggered at the time of certain Linux MM events. So that allows you to coordinate with Linux MM easier. And the second mechanism of HMM is handle MM fault, which is simply a better version of get user pages. So you can see HMM does not prevent you from writing your MM code. And if you take a look at the open sourced NVIDIA UVM driver, they do support HMM, but the support part of the HMM still implements the whole mechanisms. And the second question would be, why not just use a cache coherent bus between the CPU and the accelerator? So for example, we have the CXL, um, which supports cache coherent accesses between the CPU and accelerators. And we also have this NVIDIA link, as you guys know, it supports C2C connection between the GPU and CPU. But here is a terrible bug that I've learned when I worked at NVIDIA that it, it was reported by the IBM because NVIDIA sells the, um, the hardware to the um, IBM. So they, they collaborate with IBM and build this um, supercomputer that connects both the P9 CPU and the Volta GPU with NVLink. And the bug basically says, when I fault, when I trigger a page fault from my GPU node, the operating system populates CPU's DDR pages corresponding to that GPU page fault. So your GPU then continues to use the slow bandwidth from the CPU node. And that's a terrible bug. And it's only because the operating system is not aware of the GPU node. And GMAM would act differently because it makes the operating system aware of the accelerator nodes. So your, your NUMA nodes is not the same. It's not like all DDR and all GPU nodes are the same. So data by, by default will be pref preferably faulted on the GPU node and it will provide memory hints so that user can proactively prefetch their data. And lastly, GMAM will allow the user to decide between remote access or fault-driven migration. So the last point is a little bit subtle to understand, but in reality, we have this 
two different kinds of applications. And the first kind is the applications that may sparsely access memory with a very large memory footprint, which is, for example, the recommender system. The recommendation system uses a large embedding cache that cannot really fit in the GPU HBM. And that's why we have this Grace Hopper design that allows you to put your huge embedding cache in the CPU part. But in the remote access part, you're basically accessing the memory just one time. So you can tolerate the small bandwidth over the bus. But on the other kinds of applications, you may want to just fetch the data from the slow um, CPU DRAM to your HBM so that you can access local, ban local memory with much higher bandwidth. And now we can take a look at GMAP's implementation. And this is basically, uh, we are trying to, we're just trying to give you an overview of this because we are not going to dig deeper. So GMAP provides a unified virtual address space by changing the MM struct a little bit. We're adding a list inside the MM struct which points to the um, address space in Linux. And now we have a pointer list that is basically including all the accelerators attached to this um, process so that your applications may use. And each accelerator has their registered MMU functions so that anytime when there is any page table changes and we need to coordinate between the page tables, the underlying GMAM mechanism, we're trying to maintain a coherent mappings between these page tables using these MMU functions registered by the accelerator drivers. And the core of GMAM is the logical page table, which we borrowed the design from FreeBSD, that we borrowed the VM object that really decouples the hardware independent layer and the CPU microarchitecture specific layer. This is different from Linux as Linux is using a um, page table worker function that basically fixes how you maintain the page tables. But, but borrowing the design from FreeBSD really allows us to further decouple it so that we can put accelerators in, inside the MM um, um, processing. Okay, so here are the key features of GMAM. The first key feature is the enhanced programmability, um, which we share the CPU and accelerator pointers, and we allow transparent memory over subscription and waiving the OOM issue. The second feature is debloating the redundant memory management code. And this not only includes the user level malloc development, but also includes the driver level. And ultimately, we provide some user-guided heterogeneous memory hints. So we not only have this design and implementation, and today I'm also going to give you some preliminary evaluation results. The first evaluation we want to look at is how the programmability looks like. And here on, on the slide is a, a serial code that I wrote, basically trying to um, calculating the matrix multiplication of two buffers, which are A and B, and generate the results in buffer C and read it from the CPU. So we start by using the malloc, just as how you write your, C, um, your normal C++ program. We malloc three buffers for A and B and C. And these pointers are now shareable between your CPU and accelerators. And secondly, um, if you look at the, the generate random, th these two statements, they are trying to generate some random numbers inside buffer A and B using the CPU. And then after these two generate random statements, we have this statement which is named in -Q kernel, where we are launching a accelerator kernel to calculate the matrix multiplication between A and B, writing the results to buffer C, and it can be done directly. There's no explicit memory copying. There's no um, device-specific buffer. And after that, we, we also write this three HM device, which is GMAM's version of user-guided memory hints. 
that we are trying to prefetch asynchronously the three buffers to the accelerators. So if you guys have written any CUDA code, you may understand that launching an accelerator's kernel is non-blocking when you write the CPU code. So when you enqueue the kernel, the matrix modification kernel, um, it will return before the execution finishes. It returns only when the task is submitted and the task is now executing in parallel. So after that, we the three uh, memory prefetching will just run concurrently with the computation. So looking at the right diagram of the slide, GMAM actually presents an easy overlapping between the communication and the computation. Because there are, thinking about there are two streams. One stream is calculating the matrix multiplication. The other stream is prefetching the data. You don't need to worry about the order, like whether the, the, the data prefetching of A and B and C are executed before the matrix multiplication. You, you just don't need to worry about it. You just, you, you know, throw them into two threads and then issuing a synchronized a barrier and then the underlying GMAM system is going to guarantee the correctness. And this is because it, GMAM features a concurrent page fault mechanism so that when the computation is executed and the data is not prefetched yet, GMAM will fault the data. And if, if, if the prefetch has done, then there's no page fault. So we also look at the basic performance of the memory, memory management system and the malloc library. So we tested um, some memory sensitive applications, including Redis or GCC from the spec 2017. They, they all have like less than 1% performance penalty. And this is done with a Linux system that features GMAM. We also, we also um, put the malloc library on PyTorch running on the GMAM and we see that with the GPT, um, like GPT-2, uh, we, we ran a training of, of the large language model and we found that the average latency of malloc is like three times faster. And we also did a test on the operating system code um, bloating and we, we tested this on Huawei's AI accelerator which is named ASIN NPU. Um, the first row basically shows currently there are 30,000 lines of code in the NPU driver simply for the memory management part. And when it is um, developed on a GMAM system, it only takes like 30 lines of code to call the GMAM API. The high level API really waves um, reinventing the memory management mechanisms. And there also includes another 2,000 lines of code for the underlying MMU functions to be registered. So it reduces the development effort by 90%. We also tested it with the um, how does it behave in real applications? How does it solve the memory fragmentation issue? So we use this application which is a protein folding prediction which you can see this as an alpha fold variant. The GMAM allows it to use more HBM so that the problem size is 25% larger. So it can process larger um, protein, larger sequence of proteins. And this does not involve anything with um, memory over subscription. It's simply defragmenting memory. And the end-to-end -end inference speed is also improved, but this is kind of, um, this is kind of surprising. And we found that this is because it takes a lot of time to compile the accelerator kernels. So with, with, with more memory, this, this part is accelerated. And we're also applying GMAM to enhance the large language model inference throughput. So stay tuned for future results. GMAM also enables a transparent memory over subscription and in one sentence, uh, a 32 gigabytes HBM MPU was able to train a 52 billion parameters LLM model with only two lines of code changes in the AI framework. And 
it oversubscribed one terabyte of CPU DDR, and it's powered by the GMAP. So we also made some comparison between GMAM and NVIDIA's UVM driver, but we are not releasing the numbers now, but the numbers are, are quite um, convincing, quite positive. So to conclude our talk, um, GMAM solves the wild growth of memory service code. This not only includes your accelerator memory management in your device drivers, so at this time, the Linux MM simply works for your accelerator. And also, we prevent AI platforms to write further malloc code. And this malloc code in, in PyTorch in TensorFlow, they don't really work well. So you, you are free to choose whatever malloc code you want. Like, you can use TC malloc, you can use JE malloc. And GMAM will be the core of AI infrastructure that enhances the programmability with a unified virtual address space faster malloc speed, better memory fragmentation issue, and all the other performance improvement techniques. So um, the roadmap of open sourcing GMAM is basically, you can already have the preliminary code that's available online. Um, we also call for contribution because GMAM ultimately is a memory management change in, in the Linux but we, we want device drivers, we want uh, hardware vendors to use it so that their drivers can depend on the high level API of GMAM. And we, we also want to further um, improve the GMAM design. So we need your input, your input from accelerator vendors. And um, here's a barcode that you can scan and you, you will go to the GitHub repo that contains GMAM code. And you can also subscribe our mail list, um, including the the thick compute and thick kernel. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm ready to answer questions. Please. Mm-hmm. That will be done um, soon because we, we haven't submitted it yet, but we plan to do this very soon, very quickly. A very huge patch. Okay. Yes. And for many reasons, you can use that. You will. And also, the last recommended use was the patch to cover all of the scenes to find the origin scenes of the page. And the real approach will ever more rely on their interface. Up to a certain point, so we're to well, maybe it's going to work on every OS and every device, but if it's just one computer approach, Yes, I, I, I totally agree. But actually, the current GMAM design does not fully depend on struct page. And if you think, if you think it, um, basically, struct page is trying to track your physical memory. Yes? And we have similar struct page in FreeBSD. We have similar struct page in NVIDIA driver. You can find them in all kinds of drivers. Everyone needs to track it. So um, I don't see there's actually any conflict if we are trying to unify them together. Well, yes, it is. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to unify it so that everyone is using the driver themselves. A page is custom to a user who is first starting. So in this case, it's Alex. And he's trying to look for stuff that's first. Let's say he wasn't doing that already. He started it before. He doesn't have to redo the driver memory or anything. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of confusing. 
Well, yeah, there must be some discussion. Yeah, I agree. Sure, I, I'd like to present it in, in LSF. LSF. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, this is indeed when I talk about we, we provide memory hints about um, accessing whether you are going to access remotely or you are going to bring a page fault so that your data may be prefetched so that you can process it locally. Is that, is that the case that's similar as yours? Um, so, I guess you're you're talking about like when you're just trying to visit a small amount of, of data, but a huge page was like transferred, so that wasting a lot of time, a lot of resource. Is that correct? Okay, so we have this kind of hint that we are advising the underlying system that I'm going to access this part of data, but effectively from the user perspective, it's just a VMA, right? Uh, I'm going to access the VMA in a sparse manner. I'm going to access it very sparsely. So if there's any, I, I don't know, um, memory transfer, do it in the smallest block as you can, which in operating system is 4K, 4 kilobyte. But that may not be good as well I if your application is even more sparse, like you are a recommendation system. You just want to access maybe 256 bytes that's even smaller than 4K. And that's the case, you want to bring the cache coherent bus or MLink or, or something, or CXL, something like CXL. And in that case, you would issue a memory hint telling GMAM that I'm going to access it remotely. Don't bring the data, don't transfer it. Just let me visit it remotely. So you don't have this thrashing issue between the CPU and GPU. And so a, a little bit more extension about the problem is, this is also a problem in NVIDIA's GPU. They, they have this thrashing issue between the CPU and GPU, and they have these hints, they have this hardware access counter trying to, um, trying to monitor, trying to detect this, ca this case. And I if they detect that the same page is bouncing back and forth again and again, they are going to just ping the page on the CPU, and never transfer it again. But that requires hardware assist. Um, any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much.